All right, what's going on, everybody? It's Derek here, and we have pretty much made it to the home stretch, right? We're in week 12. We're going to go over some service definitions, and basically, you know, we're going to spend some time looking at anything that AWS could consider to be fair game, right? So, any service that they could potentially ask you about on the test based on their official study guide of what they consider to be fair game, right? We're going to look at it and we're going to go over it. And ideally, you know, you should be using this section as just like a nice refresher uh, to keep you sharp before your test. And of course, looking at each of the section summaries that we went through each week, that would also be helpful. But, you know, remember, in the day leading up to your test, don't do any of this, okay? Don't do anything. Just chill out. Remember, relax. Whatever kind of hobbies you're into, you know, do that. You want to be feeling good and rested and confident and as less stressed as possible walking into your exam on exam day. All right? So let's go through uh, these service definitions here real quick. And we'll see if we can uh, just get them done pretty quickly here, all right? So, again, everything on these last few slides, there's like 10 more or less, is considered fair game by AWS, and they can ask you about it, okay? We're going to go through these here, uh, but, you know, really do your best before we kind of talk about it. When you see the service, try to actively recall what the service is and does and what it could potentially be used for because that's how you're going to have to operate when you're taking your exam, right? You don't get to just listen to me tell you what things are. You need to pull it out of your brain, right? So start working on that skill of actively recalling information that you've studied over time, okay? You should really be looking to be quite familiar at this point with compute database storage networking and like management and logging, things of that nature. Those are kind of the foundations for really any solution in AWS running on cloud workloads is some combination of these domains. Okay, you're probably always going to have some sort of management and logging there, but you know, depending on what you're doing, you might have just kind of dipping your toe in like computing, or maybe you're just doing some of your storage in the cloud for resiliency. Uh, but these, you know, domains here are what you're really going to want to get familiar with. Okay. Uh, and then some of the other things that we'll go over today that have like more specific use cases, uh, things like Kinesis streams, for example, it's important to know like conceptually what they are and how you could use them. Because again, as solutions architects, we're looking to find the best possible solution by kind of putting different services and technologies together. So know what they are in a use case, but your in-depth knowledge should really be focused on compute database storage, networking, and management. Okay. So let me get uh, a sip here, actually. So I'm not dehydrated flying through these. All right. So you've got APIs, which stands for Application Programming Interface. It's how applications kind of interact with, uh, you know, programmatically you and your resources. Cost Explorer is what uh, lets you visualize and manage AWS costs. Cost and usage reports are instead of dashboards like in Cost Explorer, they are detailed spreadsheets describing your AWS costs. You have the CLI, which is the command line interface, and that allows you to programmatically manage and interact with your AWS resources. Elastic load balancers distribute traffic between your different resources. EC2 instance types uh, can be reserved on demand or spot instances. Uh, Amazon Machine Images, AMIs, are basically templates on how to build and deploy EC2 instances, so you don't have to constantly specify your instance settings every time you make one. The AWS Management Console is what we use in pretty much all the labs. It's the web interface to manage AWS resources. AWS Marketplace allows you to buy or sell software solutions in, on AWS. Okay, you buy the solution and then run it on AWS resources. Security groups are stateful and they control traffic at the instance level, right? Network access control lists, otherwise known as NACLs, are stateless. They control traffic at the network level, okay? The subnet level, all right? 
Uh, AWS Service Catalog controls what services can be used in an organization. Service quotas is the max limit of something you can have or do. So for example, the max limit of EC2 instances you can have in one region. Software Development Kits, SDKs, are software uh, that help you integrate your application languages with AWS. So really any kind of modern programming language, JavaScript, Python, Java, whatever, they've all got an SDK, all right? The support plans are basic, developer, business, enterprise, and again, there's enterprise on-ramp, which is essentially the same thing as enterprise, but just a little scaled down, okay? Virtual private network, VPN, is a secure connection between your end users and your network. And if we look at more of the sections now, right, for services, you've got the analytics, which include Amazon Athena, which is a SQL-like query service to analyze logs and data, used largely for S3, uh, things stored in S3, rather. Amazon Kinesis allows you to analyze real-time streaming data. Amazon QuickSight uses dashboards and reports used for BI, business intelligence. Amazon EMR, Elastic Map Producer, runs and scales big data workloads. Application integration, we're talking about Amazon SNS Simple Notification Service. It is used to send notifications based on events, right? Works on that publisher subscriber model, all right? Amazon Simple Queue Service is a queue system designed to pass messages and events between services. Amazon EventBridge builds event-driven applications. And AWS Step Functions allows you to uh, kind of visually build out your application architecture. If we look at the compute and serverless domain, we've got uh, AWS Batch, which is a service to run large-scale batch machine learning computing jobs. Right? Elastic Compute Cloud, EC2, we talked about this one a lot. It handles all your computing work, okay? AWS Elastic Beanstalk is a hands-off service to deploy and scale web applications. AWS Lambda runs serverless compute jobs. Amazon LightSail is like Beanstalk, but a little more hands-off. AWS manages more of the complexities. And Amazon Workspaces are fully managed virtual desktops, commonly prescribed for like end users, okay? Containers, we've got ECS, Elastic Container Service, which runs highly secure and scalable containers, or allows you to do that, rather. Elastic Kubernetes Service uses Kubernetes to manage your Docker containers running on AWS. And then AWS Fargate is going to basically be one of those hands-off services that deploys your apps to AWS managed containers. So again, it takes some of the work uh, off of your hands and having to provision your containers, okay? Database, we've got Amazon Aurora, which is a AWS native serverless MySQL and PostgreSQL service. Right? Amazon DynamoDB is the NoSQL database service. Elasticache is an in-memory caching service. RDS is the relational database service that supports pretty much all modern and popular SQL engines you would need. Uh, Amazon Redshift is a data warehousing service, okay? AWS Application Discovery Service is something that allows you to discover on-prem server inventories to plan cloud migrations. You've got uh, AWS Application Migration Service, which migrates on-prem and or cloud applications. And these are all kind of migration services, uh, if you haven't noticed. AWS Database Migration Service, otherwise known as DMS, helps you to migrate databases and other data storages in or out of the cloud. You've got DataSync, which simplifies the management of migration workloads. Migration Hub, which is a central location to manage and track your migration projects. And the AWS Snow family are physical appliances to transport data into the cloud. You've got Snow Cone, which is uh, the smallest version. You've got Snowball, and then you've got Snowmobile, which is, again, that giant semi-truck, all right? Uh, push too many buttons there. Where are we at? There we go. Uh, so in management, monitoring, and governance, we've got AWS Auto Scaling. It scales resources up or down automatically to meet demand of your application. 
We've got AWS budgets, which allow you to set budgets to control costs and be notified if you are approaching at or exceeding your budget. Uh, cloud formation uses templates to automate your infrastructure deployment, scaling in or down, uh, out or in, up or down, vertical, you know, whatever you want to say. Uh, AWS CloudTrail monitors user activity and API usage in your account, so it's thinking about who did it. And CloudWatch is monitoring the state of your actual AWS infrastructure, so what happened and what is happening with my resources. Okay. AWS Config is what allows you to evaluate the configuration and compliance of your resources. Amazon EventBridge, formerly known as CloudWatch Events, is what triggers actions based on events. And it you know kind of works hand in hand with CloudWatch and it's based around events that actually happen in CloudWatch based on the you know the metrics you're tracking. AWS License Manager allows you to manage your required software licenses. AWS Managed Services is just kind of a broad term that encompasses AWS services where all the software of the actual service is maintained by AWS. And as you would imagine, because you don't have to manage any of that, it helps organizations fully use AWS. So for example, with EC2, that's you know, software running behind the scenes. It's actually provisioning your instances for you. All right. AWS organizations allow you to essentially group and manage multiple AWS accounts. AWS Secrets Manager allows you to essentially manage the lifecycle of your secrets that are being referenced, okay, in your application. Systems Manager allows you to essentially monitor and configure your resources. AWS Trusted Advisor is what provides recommendations to help you follow AWS best practices in those five domains. Okay. Networking and content delivery. We've got Amazon API Gateway, which helps you to maintain and secure the APIs your applications are using. CloudFront is what caches your data around the world using those edge locations as part of the global infrastructure to improve the performance for the end users that are accessing your content. All right, elastic load balancing is what basically distributes requests and workloads between different resources. AWS Direct Connect is a direct physical connection between AWS and your on-premise network. Amazon Route 53 is a DNS name resolution service. The VPC, Virtual Private Cloud, is what encompasses pretty much everything and all of your, you know, your account's resources. It's the private, logically isolated area of the cloud where you're going to deploy resources, all right? Every resource needs to be in a VPC. If it's not in a custom VPC, it's in the default one that AWS gives you, all right? Storage, AWS Backup allows you to centrally manage your backups using policies. Elastic Block Store, EBS, is block storage that's designed to be attached to EC2 instances and work very closely with those. Elastic File System, EFS, is a serverless scalable file storage. Okay, FSx is similar, uh, but it allows you to launch and scale high performance file systems for more specific use cases, so things like, you know, Windows, uh, and there's a couple other ones. Uh, simple Storage Service, S3, is a essentially infinitely scalable object storage. Okay, it's one of AWS's primary, uh, or flagship services, rather. S3 Glacier is a subset of S3. It's a very cheap storage, but it's for archive. It's going to take a while to get your data back once it's in there. AWS Storage Gateway allows you to combine on-premise and cloud storage, all right? Security, identity, and compliance. We've got AWS Artifact, which allows you to download AWS compliance reports from all over the world, all sorts of countries and regions. AWS Certificate Manager lets you create and manage SSL and TLS certificates if you are using those. Cloud HSM is a physical device that stores your encryption keys and encryption methods. 
It's uh, basically designed to self-destruct if it detects, you know, being tampered with, which obviously is inconvenient because you could lose your encryption keys, but it's much less convenient than somebody getting your encryption keys and exposing you. Okay. Amazon Cognito is a service to provide federated identities to access services, things like Apple and Google and other open auth logins. Amazon Detective visually analyzes your uh, data for security. You've got Guard Duty, it protects your AWS accounts from malicious activity. IAM, Identity and Access Management, is the primary service under the security and access control domain. It helps you to essentially manage and provide identities that allow users or services to access resources. Amazon Inspector inspects the security status of your EC2 instances and workloads. Amazon Macy is designed to scan over data, for example, in S3 to discover potentially exposed sensitive data, like maybe social security numbers or health records, things like that. AWS Shield is what allows you to protect yourself and your applications from DDoS attacks. And then finally, you've got Web Application Firewall, which, as the name implies, it protects your web applications from commonly known threats, and then you can make custom rules as well. Okay? So that's it. We made it to the end. Like, I think almost 300 slides in. Like, my goodness. You know, if you've made it to this point, then... I would say you're committed, you're going to pass this test, you know, just remember that the work you put in is the results you're going to get, okay? You want to be a little over-prepared so that there's no question you're going to pass as opposed to, you know, just trying to get by and doing just enough, you know, it's not going to work, okay? So make sure you're doing the labs, do the quizzes, retake the quizzes, go through the sections, you know, at this point, if there's any labs or sections that maybe didn't make sense, go back and review those as opposed to trying to like gloss over everything. You know, if you're feeling really strong with like storage services and S3 and all that, then don't spend any more time with it. You know, you got it, right? Just brush up on maybe what is a little rustier and a little less familiar. Uh, and again, make sure you're really familiar with, you know, the domains of compute, storage, database, networking, and management. And the other things, you can just sort of know them at a high level to be able to speak to them and maybe fit them into a potential use case. All right. So that's the end of this guide 12 weeks later. Uh, you know, by next week, if you aren't, if you don't have the exam scheduled for next week, I should say, retake the quizzes, aim for a higher score, review the section summaries, review the service definitions. Uh, and again, it's very important the day before, just chill, relax, go in there with a good mindset, right? A good energy and you'll be fine. All right. So hopefully this has all been helpful. Uh, I wish you the best of luck. I hope you pass the first time. I'm sure you will if you've done the work. All right. And if you are going to check out any other guides, of course, that would be great. Continue your cloud computing journey. We'll put up more courses as they become available. But in the meantime, best of luck on your Solutions Architect Associate exam, and we will see you next time.